Uh, about five years or so uh, ago, uh, I had the opportunity to take uh, the longest flight I'd ever been on. And it was far from uh, the two-hour flight from Toronto to Deer Lake, Newfoundland that I've been used to uh, for most of my life. This flight uh, was out of Toronto, but it was direct, no stops, and the flying time for this flight uh, was 14 and a half hours, give or take. Uh, the flight path uh, took me from Pearson in Toronto uh, to Bole Airport in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And it was during our Canadian winter. So I was more than happy to get on a plane in Pearson and get out of Canada. The weather change was certainly uh, something uh, that I was looking forward to, a welcome shift. And it was the first plane I was ever on where they gave me a really cool pair of socks. And I didn't wear the socks because they were just so cool. But it was Ethiopian Airlines, and they've got the green and the yellow colors so bright and vibrant. I loved it. And the socks were so cool. And I'm a sock person. So I'm like, this is so sweet. I got a free pair of socks. And I can't wait to get home and show these off uh, to the kids. So I took them, tucked them into my carry-on. Didn't realize uh, that when I got off the plane 14 hours later, that these weren't just really cool-looking socks after all. They're actually compression socks, meant to keep the blood flowing in my feet when you're sitting down for 14 and a half hours straight. And I realized that when I was time to get off the plane and I couldn't get my shoes on because my feet were so swollen. But a uh, cool pair of socks nonetheless, still have them. Uh, the purpose of my visit to Ethiopia uh, was to visit with the leadership of a church that you may not have heard of, some of you may have. It's a church called the Kalahewit Church. Kalahewit is Ethiopian uh, for Word of Life. The Word of Life Church, Kalahewit Church. The Kalahewit Church is an evangelical force to be reckoned with in this world. The movement of Jesus through the Kalahewit Church in Ethiopia, Africa, has followers that count over 9 million members. Process that, 9 million. So the church is not dying everywhere in the world. You need to know that. 9 million people, 10,000 churches strong, and more than 100 Bible colleges actively training pastors and missionaries to get out there and do the work. So yeah, you heard the numbers right. And they were probably even lowballed at this point as years have passed. Because we normally surround ourselves with people who have our same life experiences, I knew that I was probably about to hear stories about what God was doing in the world, stories about what the Holy Spirit was doing in the world that would blow my mind because it was out of my box and I wouldn't understand it. And I wasn't there very long, and this definitely happened. I ran into something that didn't fit my box of how God was supposed to work, but was something very powerful that the Holy Spirit was up to in the world that my box had no choice but to be widened. I, I was visiting a very rural, and when I say rural, I mean very rural. I can't describe how rural it was. A very rural Bible school. And uh, it was very far away from any city, city center. A and this felt to me like it was the most isolated place I'd ever been in my life. And I've lived in isolation pretty much uh, my whole life. Let me go back here. And so here I was in this very rural Ethiopian village at, at a Bible college, getting to know some of the teachers. Uh, this guy is a machine for the gospel. This dude has more energy than I'm ever going to have in, in this lifetime. And it's all for Jesus. Amazing people. And as I was making my way around uh, the college and getting to know some of the teachers and getting to rub shoulders with some of, of the church uh, leaders, it was kind of what I knew. I had been in situations like this before. I had been in Bible colleges overseas before. As a matter of fact, I worked as a principal short term at a Bible college in Malawi, Africa before. So I was prepared for what I thought I was about to see. At least what I thought I was about to see. And then we walked into the classroom. And again, that's, a, that's an environment I'm used to. And I know what to expect. In that kind of classroom, it's usually me that sticks out. I am the big white man. I know that. And as a matter of fact, once 
when I was in a furniture store in Malawi, Africa, trying to find a couch for my house, a storekeeper comes up to me and says, this is truth, he looks at me and says, you are the biggest, whitest person I've ever seen. <laughs> it's hard to know how to take that. But again, that was the truth of it. So I expected this to be a similar situation. Uh, a big white man amongst a group of Ethiopian nationals in, in a Bible college in the middle of rural Africa. And when I went in, that was not the case. What I actually saw was outside my box in a way that I'd never processed before. Inside that classroom, there were three or four Chinese students in this class, along with the rest of the Ethiopian uh, nationals. And as I looked around and listened to the teacher teaching and trying to pick up kind of some cultural pieces that I could learn from them, my mind was trying to process, why would there be Chinese students in an Ethiopian Bible college really out there in the far reaches of rural Ethiopia? Why would they be there? This does not make sense to what I thought and was taught that missions is. It's not how we do it. So stick with me. I'm going somewhere with this. As we came to learn, and as I asked questions later, we learned that because of much of the work that was exploding in Ethiopia in those days, lots of around infrastructure and lots of things being built, many Chinese people were leaving China and moving to Ethiopia for employment. So as many Chinese folks were leaving China and going to Ethiopia for employment, the Chinese church leadership decided that in order to reach their own people with the good news of Jesus, that they should send missionaries to follow them to Ethiopia and then find ways to reach their own people with the good news of Jesus in Ethiopia. And to do this and to learn the ethos of the country and the culture and how to communicate the gospel in this space, willing Chinese missionary students enrolled themselves in Ethiopian Bible colleges so they could learn the culture and reach their own people who had moved to that foreign land. That blew my mind. That's a far cry from the way I once learned in the Western world how missions was supposed to work. God is always up to something different. And if our minds are never open and widened to process the thing that God is doing that's outside of our box, then we need to seek God more. And if we never hear the stories, if we never truly open our minds and our hearts to what God is up to, we are going to be the ones that are going to miss out. The passage that we heard read uh, today is a whopper of a passage. It's a long story, so we tried to keep you awake with someone else's voice uh, besides mine or our lovely hosts around here. But the passage that you heard today was from Acts chapter 15. And as I process in this series, some of the passages that really got a hold of me in the last couple months and the last couple of years, Acts 15 is one that's really got a hold of me about five or six years ago. And it's come to really shape me, and it's certainly come to shape the way I see ministry, for sure, in some very significant ways. God has used this passage to speak to me many different ways, at many different times, through the passage that you heard played in your hearing today, in Acts chapter 15. So maybe you know the story, I'm going to assume you don't, even though I know that most of you probably do. Acts 15 is actually the story of a church business meeting, an annual business meeting, if you would. And I've been to lots of annual business meetings. In 25 years almost of being a pastor, I've been to more than my share, and they've not all been the things that pastors are most likely to be anxious to get to because they love them so much. Likely not the case. But this one was one of the most interesting annual business meetings you could ever sit in on. Because they were not voting on changing the colors of the carpet. They weren't debating uh, the church's operational budget. No, this was a church business meeting that had some serious teeth on it. God was doing some amazing work reaching people outside of the Jewish ranks. Gentiles, the Bible calls those folks. And then in Acts 15 opens with the news that there were some people causing trouble 
saying that these Gentiles who were being saved can't really be saved unless they follow the law to the letter. Now that caused some problems in this church. Paul and Barnabas who, Barnabas, who were two of the early church's leaders in this story, were very upset with this, what they considered to be false teaching. And so they were designated to go to Jerusalem, to go to like the church's head office, to meet with the broader church, and to meet with the leaders of the broader church, to see who can really be in the church, and who might not really be a fit for the church, and how that's all going to work out. Now that is an ABM or an AGM with plenty of tension in it. So Paul and Barnabas are, and others, even on their journey to Jerusalem, to this annual general meeting, they were hearing stories on their journey from people along the way that they talked to, Gentiles or outsiders, about what God was doing in their lives and how God was saving them and how God was bringing them into the family of believers through faith alone. Through faith alone. Not through anything that the law said. Not through anything that these other teachers were saying they needed to do. But these Gentiles were blowing the minds of Paul and Barnabas, telling them the stories of what God was doing in their lives simply because they believed on Jesus. That was it. And Paul and Barnabas had seen these stories, lots of them, firsthand. And they experienced lots of these stories firsthand about these people who were accepting Christ, who had been once on the outside of the church, now feeling that Christ had brought them on the inside of the church, even when some people on the inside of the church thought the people from the outside of the church didn't really belong. And the work God was doing in the lives of these people, outside of keeping the law, was simply, absolutely, 100%, 1,000%, undeniable. You could not deny the work that God was doing in the lives of these folks who were technically outside of the church because they didn't follow the whole law. They were believing by faith alone. But their stories and the proof of how their lives were being changed was undeniable. So this meeting had some, had some people who were there, a couple different pe groups of people. There was one people in this story who were supportive of the stance that caused the initial stir. These folks were called the Pharisees, defenders of the law and defenders of the scriptures. And they aligned with the people who were saying that these Gentiles can't be saved unless they follow the law to the letter. And they were seen as being the defenders of, of tradition. And their posture was seemingly unmovable. And on the other side of this debate, you had the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and other church leaders who had been on the front lines. They'd been out there with people. They'd been in the neighborhoods. They'd been in the coffee shops. They'd been everywhere. They weren't the ones who were just studying the law. They were out there in the front lines with people. And they were hearing from the experiences, the stories, the miracles, what God was actually doing in the lives of people and what the Holy Spirit was doing in the lives of people simply through faith. And those stories were simply undeniable. You could not get around those things. The fruit was there. Jesus was evident in those folks. No matter what argument was used, no matter what argument got brought forward, no matter what scriptures were quoted, the proof was in the stories of faith that God was bringing these people into the family of God and making them like Christ outside of the letter of the law. No tension in this meeting whatsoever. So here's the catch. If the Apostle Paul probably, and I'm just surmising here, because I love to read into this stuff. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Here's the catch. If the Apostle Paul had not seen this work of God for himself, if he had not been the one out there, if he had not been talking to these folks, if he had not been having coffee with these people, if he had not been out there, but he was simply studying the law, he probably would have been on the side of the Pharisees. Probably would have been. But he was out there, firsthand, got the stories firsthand 
of what God was doing in the lives of these wonderful folks. Simply through faith, not through anything they were supposed to do or not do. Paul probably would have sided with the Pharisees if he had not been out there with them. Stick with the law. It's what we've known. It's what we've studied. It's what we've always heard preached and taught. It's always steered us properly. Then God blew their boxes apart. God blew their boxes apart because they had been on the ground, in the communities, in the homes, around the tables of Gentiles, and they learned and saw that the stories of what the Holy Spirit is doing also has a very important place in determining what the family of faith looks like. Hard stop. If you're a note taker, write that down. The stories of what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world, in the lives of people, also count. They count. It's not just, well, this is the way we've always done it, or this is what this verse says. This, it's not all. The stories of faith, of what God is doing in the lives of people, what the Holy Spirit is doing, you can't deny it even if you wanted to. Those stories are important when it comes to determining what the family of faith looks like. And you can tell I'm kind of into this. This scripture has changed my life. And it's almost as if Paul and Barnabas went to a rural Ethiopian Bible college and God showed them that missions is larger than they thought it was. And God just blew their boxes apart. God blew their boxes apart. No matter what the law said, no matter what the traditions looked like, it was not possible to dismiss what God was clearly doing. It was just not possible. And this whole chapter, I love this story. I love it because it creates so many different groups of thinking in the room and it creates a little bit of tension, which I kind of like too. This whole chapter comes to a decision point. And this is where things take a whole new turn for the church. I love this verse so much that it's probably become my life verse. It's probably become my life verse. It's got into my guts that much. It's got into my heart that deep. It's gotten to my spirit so, so entrenched that this is one of the things I believe as a follower of Jesus and as a leader in the church. I fully believe that we should never make it difficult for anyone turning to God. And if that day comes, then Shane Sims is out. I will be out. I will not be part of a family like that. I will not be part of a movement that says we're followers of Jesus, if this is the way that we operate, if we make it difficult for people who are turning to faith to find faith, even when it doesn't fit the box that you've got, I can't do it. I just can't. I can't. It's my judgment, therefore we should never make it difficult for anyone coming to God. So, well, I think, well, I know, I do know, I know too well, that there are too many times that the church has made it difficult for people who are coming to God. I do know that. My story counts too. As a pastor in the church over the course of two decades, I have felt this way too many times. Dr. Sylvia Kiesmat, uh, maybe you can Google her. Uh, she's a Canadian New Testament scholar uh, at the Institute for Christian Studies, uh, and she studied under N.T. Wright, who may be a familiar name to some of you, and I've actually had the opportunity to meet with her and to connect with her. She is brilliant, and she describes Acts chapter 15 as the widening of the gospel. I love that. The widening of the gospel. It's the broadening of the gospel. But I wonder how wide we've actually made the gospel sometimes. I wonder how wide we've let the gospel be sometimes. In a scholarly article she wrote called Welcoming the Gentiles, I have it if you'd like a copy of it. It's deep reading, but boy, it will break your box to smithereens. <laughs> Sylvia talks about how in Acts chapter 15, the Pharisees seemingly had scripture and tradition on their side. 100%. They had both. This is what the scriptures say and this is what tradition says. But the whole story of Acts centers around the importance of friends 
and hospitality and the sharing of stories about what God is doing. And it was in these places that it was truly discovered what the Holy Spirit was doing in the world. It's for sure important that in the doing of theology, in our deliberations where we discuss the widening of the gospel, that we too take a very intent, keen, intentional listen to the stories of what God is doing in the world, in the lives of people who you may have thought were excluded. And the church might have excluded them. But the Holy Spirit didn't exclude them. That's you. That's not God. The Holy Spirit never excludes anyone who's trying to see Christ. We're living in a day where uh, we see and hear of the plight of marginalized communities, maybe now more than ever before. And that is a good thing that we know and hear about that. The plight of the poor or the stories of many of our friends who are black, indigenous, and people of color. These are all the stories of our time that need to be heard as we process what the widening of the gospel looks like. And I think today specifically about our gay friends, folks of the LGBTQ plus community who have more often than not not experienced the love and the grace of the church. And I've been on the other side of that way too many times. And have seen the pain associated with that way too many times. As a pastor in the church of Jesus Christ, this has kept me awake at night, made me question myself, made me question my integrity, made me question my own leadership. And I promised myself five or six years ago that this wasn't going to be who I was going to become. This promise that I made to myself has led me to take a number of steps in my pastoral vocation. And one of those steps has led me to here, to Hillside Church. You know what? I'm thankful that Hillside is known as, at least narratively known, at least through the hearing, known as a warm, loving place to all marginalized folks. I hope that's who we are. That's who I, that's who I hear we are. And in the hearing of that, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. So I hope that it's actually true. But I also believe that we have to refresh Acts chapter 15 amongst us in the days that are ahead of us. Because there's a lot more work to do. A whole lot more. Let me ask you a question. Today we're talking about storytelling. Hearing stories. Listening to what God's doing in someone's life over coffee. Outside of what you know about the law and our traditions what the Holy Spirit is doing in someone's life. When was the last time you ever sat down with someone from the LGBTQ plus community who loves Jesus to see what Jesus is doing in their life today? I would suspect that for most of us, maybe we've never done that for lots of different reasons. Some of us just may have never had the opportunity. Maybe that's not our orbit. Maybe it's just not... Uh, where, we, where we find ourselves. There's lots of different reasons. But I'd love to encourage you to. I'd love to encourage you to. Ask questions like, what's Jesus doing in your life? I'd love to ask everyone questions like this. You take me over coffee and I'm probably going to ask you something like, what's the last scripture that God used to speak to you? I'm not trying to test you or quiz you. <laughs> I'm trying to find out what's God doing in your life. And in some of the conversations I've had with members of the LGBTQ plus community, my gay friends, and I say to them, what's God saying to you these days? Boy, I'm telling you, I leave in tears. But what the Holy Spirit is clearly, clearly, clearly doing, scripture, tradition, narrative, they all come in play when we determine what the family of faith looks like. And that makes being at an Acts 15 kind of church a very important uh, a very important thing for us. We need to figure out what that looks like for us. What does it mean to be an Acts 15 kind of Christian real time? Because when we have no discernible lens to see what God is actually doing in someone's life, what the Holy Spirit is actually doing, what you rely on, what you know and what you've heard. When you've got no active lens, you don't know. You don't know. 
Because you've never asked. You've never had the copies. You've never found the friends. And you've got no sweet clue what the Holy Spirit is doing around you and you're missing it. It's an interesting piece, isn't it? Even in Acts chapter 15, catch this. In Acts 15, with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and the Pharisees and all that stuff, the Scripture and tradition alone was not enough to guide the church into the widening of the gospel. The stories had to be taken into consideration. The narrative had to be taken into account about what God was doing so that the gospel could be widened. The stories are important because they are lens to see what God is actually doing right now. I love this quote. I love watching people write stuff down too. Cheers my heart. Gives me a good night's sleep on a Sunday. Sylvia Keysmat says this. She says, when the Spirit of God is working in people's lives, we don't use the Scriptures to inhibit the work of the Spirit. Let that sit on you today. When the Spirit of God is working in people's lives, we don't use the Scriptures to inhibit, to stop, to put a damper on the work of the Spirit. Boy, I've been part of too many conversations in Jesus' church where people have used the scriptures to put out the flame of what the Holy Spirit was doing in someone's life. That is not a movement that comes from God. When the Spirit of God is working in someone's life, we don't use the scriptures to proof text and stop the work of the Spirit in that person's life. In a very recent conversation with a dear, dear friend of mine who is a gay Christian who loves Jesus with all of his heart, we were chatting about my Pentecostal heritage. And then uh, this was said. Shane, the, the Pentecostals I know were always so good at receiving drunks and drug addicts and thieves and womanizers and the worst of the worst. But a gay person, they would never, ever truly accept me. And I want to thank God for that conversation. Because boy, that got down in me as someone who was a leader in that circle for 15 years. I gave the best, young, energetic years of my life to that. And what that person said to me was true. Because I was one of the drunks that came off the street. I was one of the dudes that strolled in the back of that church and stank so bad of the clubs and the bars and all the crap going on in the world that nobody in that church even wanted to sit next to me. But then when I made the decision to follow Jesus, I was the poster boy that got glorified in the church. Look at the work that God is doing. So I know what this person said is true. Because I've lived it. I've been there. And what this individual said was absolutely correct. And that's had a profound impact on me. That was a conversation this summer. That was a fresh conversation about what God is doing right now. So over the course of uh, the coming months and the fall leading into winter, uh, the elders are going to be leading a conversation around here about how we as Hillside Church accept love and include the marginalized groups amongst us where God is clearly doing work through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be talking about how we treat, love, and include folks from the gay community whom God is clearly at work, undisputably at work in their lives. So it's a conversation that's coming in the months that are to come. Time to talk to learn. Maybe you've never listened before. Well, now you'll get opportunity. The church should be the best listeners in the world to see what God's up to in the lives of people who maybe you have held on the outside for maybe way, way, way too long. So, a little bit of a glimpse in terms of where we want to go as a church. And, and it's under that premise that I came here. 
So there's no secret. And I hope that you'll be open uh, to that. And I hope that you can open your ears and your, and your minds to see uh, what God is doing in the world, what God is doing in the lives of some of the most beautiful folks you'll ever meet, what the Holy Spirit is doing, whether you like that or prefer that or not. So that we at Hillside Church can state in a very specific way. You know, if we could write something that ends our vision statement for me, this would be it as a church. That we're never going to make it difficult for anyone who's turning 